Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone, and welcome back again to As I Live and Grieve. We have a returning guest again, one of our very favorites. John Polo is back with us again. This time, this is kind of like the second segment about dating. This one more specifically, how to date a widow. Welcome back, John. Thank you for having me again. It's great to be back. Oh, you're always welcome here. Would you just refresh for our listeners a little bit about your background, please? Yeah. Um, So I fell in love with my wife, Michelle, in high school. We dated for a year and then she broke my heart. (laughs) Seven years later, we reunited and it was like a dream come true, if I'm being honest. But two and a half years after that, she got a really, really horrible cancer. She fought it for two years before she passed away. So she passed away January of 2016. So as we record this, it's almost seven years for me, which seems really crazy. About a month after she passed, a friend suggested I start a blog because I did not know what to do with myself. I was absolutely going stir crazy. I was just overcome with grief. A friend said, you know, you need to process your thoughts and emotions and you like to write. So I started a blog, you know, again, I don't think the world was particularly used to a 31 year old man pouring his heart out on social media. Plus, I think I'm a pretty good writer. (laughs) So the blog took off. And since then, it has eventually turned into three books and a full time coaching and speaking career. That's great. And yes, you are a writer because I love the words you put on the pages. Today, our focus is pretty specific as we talk about dating And it's pretty much based on John's newest book, I believe, uh, How to Date a Widow 101. So this is a specific perspective. The book is pretty much geared toward someone who is wanting to or already dating a widow. But there are also kind of pages in there that are written for the widow herself. So I have to say, John, you know, I love this book like I do your others, and I love the tips and the insight you offer to people, and we will say in this instance, men ready to date a widow. You have a style that is, well, I'll say sometimes a little snarky, sometimes a little sarcastic, but all of that makes the book very, very easy to read, like someone's talking to you and having a serious conversation. One of my favorite parts, and I have the book here that I can refer to, is that you say the people who come into your life now are not responsible for the damage done by the people of your past. Can you kind of tell me where that came from? I know you talk about um, women specifically that have had problems with their marriage and the men now dating them who kind of get caught up in that damage that has been done. Well, it's interesting. A couple thoughts. Yes, there are parts of the book that are snarky. (laughs) I'm kind of a jerk in some of my writings. I'll admit it. Like for all of the beautiful, emotional, heartfelt things I write, sometimes I can be a little bit of a jerk. But I do think that's the product of seeing just the different things that widowed people go through, through my coaching. Sometimes I get fed up with it, right? (laughs) What other people kind of say to us or put us through. As far as that, it's interesting because the title of the book tends to throw a lot of people off. So I will say, you know, the title of the book is How to Date a Widow 101. Sometimes on my social media, people will say, well, you know, what, when are you going to write a book for a widower? And I'll say, okay, maybe I got a little too creative with the title because it's actually, it doesn't matter. Male, female, it doesn't matter. It's for everyone. The other thing about the book is I have to be honest, despite the title If somebody came up to me and said, you know, I'm a widow, I'm a widow, and I've been dating this guy for three months, who is the book more important for? Despite the title, I would actually say the book is more important for the widow to read. I think that they should be reading it first, the widow person, and then if they like it, they can hand it to a love interest, right? So that page that you asked me about, that's more intended for the widowed person to read. 
And what I see through my coaching is that a lot of people allow is not the right word, but it's the only word coming to me. A lot of people allow their past pain to dictate how they see their present and their future. A lot of people, if they you know dated someone in the past who was toxic, who was not good to them, they might write off future people because they've been so hurt in the past and you know all people are going to hurt me and I don't trust this new person. I think that when we do that, we give way too much power to the people who have hurt us in the past. I really think it's important that we look at each new person as their own individual human, right? And not give all of our power to the people who have hurt us in the past. So that's where that quote came from. I like that. I I agree with everything you said. I personally found the book empowering, and I am certainly the widow, not the widower. But I was empowered by the book, I think. I certainly felt stronger. I felt that some of my personal beliefs were affirmed. So I appreciate that very much. In another section of the book, you talk about the idea of when you date someone, letting that person know that you have lost someone special to you. And there was apparently a conversation about how long do you wait? And your opinion, of course, is to do it on the very first date. And you even say, how can you not know? How can you not let someone know that you have lost someone very important to you? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Look, I'll be honest. If I have a client who's strictly looking to go out there and date and have fun and, and knows that they, they are not looking for anything serious at all, Fine. Then if you don't want to tell somebody, don't tell them. Like sometimes, you know, this is incredibly personal to us, right? It's, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to us. We don't need to share it with everybody all the time if we don't want to. But if you're going out there and you're looking for something serious, from my perspective, I'd rather let that person know sooner rather than later. And now that, that probably means the first date, because if they're that off put by it, if they don't think that they can, you know, handle the fact that I'm a widower who is always going to love his deceased wife, then I don't really need to waste any more time with them. I'll tell you a quick story. I don't think I told it to you on the last podcast. Hopefully I didn't. So I had somebody early on ask me, you know, it was maybe about 13, 14 months in, I don't remember exactly. They said, you know, John, are you thinking about dating at all? Are you thinking about getting back out there? And I said, yeah, well, you know, I've thought about it, but what am I going to do? You know, I'm going to go on plenty of fish and, you know, say I'm a widower who, you know, is still in love with his deceased wife and, you know, has a blog about how much he loves her and misses her. And, you know, by the way, you know, I'm a step parent, you know, who, you know, raises my stepdaughter, which was, you know, her daughter. And, you know, I have multiple sclerosis and what am I going to do? I I was kind of joking, right? But I mean, I was serious at the same time. I'm going to go out and I'm going to put all that. And as far as my loss, this person said to me, well, just don't tell them until the third date. And I'm thinking, how do you go on a first date with another human and not mention that you have a dead wife? Not mention that you are still actively the parent to her child. Like, how do you do that? I don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and that's that's what this section alluded to. And, and I loved that because it's, I don't know, full disclosure, I suppose. Just like I would, I would be really upset if I was dating someone and then on the third date, sixth date, twelfth date, whatever, all of a sudden I found out, for, for example, they were still married. I mean, that's a critical thing. And the same thing with losing a partner or a spouse like that. That's critical. That's key to the person who you are. And I think to to not disclose that, if you will, is it's not fair. It's just not fair. Her love and her loss, all of our time together, everything that we ever went through together have made me into the person I am today. So if if you want to get to know me, (laughs) you have to know that as well. 
right? It's a part of me, like it lives inside of me. Also, I'll say, you know, not so much with the dating, but just with being a widower in general, I would tell people about Michelle, the fact that I was a widower, all that, I would tell them at the very first opportunity, no matter what. And as I look back now, I mean, I kind of knew it in the moment, but looking back years later, being like, well, why did you do that, John, right? If I'm talking to myself and evaluating myself. And there was a few reasons. One is that, you know, I just didn't want the world thinking I was divorced or that I was a single guy. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that wasn't my truth. And I didn't want people thinking it about me. But the other part of it was I was so incredibly proud to have her as my wife that by telling people, yeah, I was, you know, I'm a widower. I lost my wife. Like I was bringing her memory, her love, our story back to the forefront because I was so proud to have her as my wife. So I would actually lean into my story very early on. I, I appreciate that very much. Now, we're talking about dating, and obviously there are people, men and women alike, who after a loss say, well, I'm not ready for dating. So this whole factor about time is there a time frame you think, and we may have discussed this before, but I think it bears repeating. Is there a time frame for grief that you think that it's safe to put yourself out there again? I know that some people would disagree with me and, and I'm not always right. <laughs> My wife used to tell me that, right? But I have to tell you, I've done over 4,000 coaching sessions. I've met countless wind widowed people. Um, I don't think that there is an exact timeline. You know, anybody who's telling you, like, you have to wait a year. Okay, you know, maybe that's a good timeline for some people to give. But I know people who had very, very, very healthy, happy marriages who were madly in love with their deceased spouse, who usually weren't even looking under a year, but somehow stumbled upon somebody amazing and now once again have a happy, healthy relationship with somebody new. I know people who, you know, might be 11 months in, who I would say seem more ready than somebody maybe four years in. I don't think there's a real timeline. I think every case is so unique, you know, to each individual person, their heart, their healing, et cetera. I will say, you know, I never judge somebody on when they want to start dating again, right? Like, do you, right? Live your life. But if we start dating when we are in a very, very bad place still, the one thing I'll say is that we make it much more likely that we're going to make bad decisions, right? So the more kind of you can process your grief, you know, maybe you can find some healing, you work through things, you kind of rebuild a little bit, you're more likely to make healthier decisions when you are dating. Okay, and we started this discussion last podcast. But if someone says, I never want to date again, I never want to open myself up to that experience again, is that abnormal? No, no, that's not abnormal at all. And that's the thing, you know, as much as I talk about we shouldn't judge widowed people for wanting to date again, right? And that's where they'll sit down and shut up peace, which I know you love. Like, that's where it came from. I also think we should not judge widowed people who don't want to date again. Like, we have to, I've, I've said this a million times, and I'll say it a million more before my career is over. We have to empower ourselves enough to grieve our own way, and then eventually to live our own way. The only thing I will say is if I'm working with a client who says they don't want to date ever, ever, ever again, First of all, like sometimes that can evolve, right? I've seen that said to me. And then six months later, a year later, they're starting to feel differently. But the only other thing is I just want to make sure that it's not just your self-esteem holding you back, just your self-worth holding you back, or just your guilt holding you back. The other thing that can hold people back is fear. Although I think that's a that's one that I'm a little bit more... How can I say it? it? Fear is something that I feel like if it holds you back, it's not my job to tell you not to let it hold you back. Self-esteem's holding you back. Let's work on it. Self-worth's holding you back. Let's work on it. Guilt is holding you back. Let's work on it. Not because I want to get you to a place where you want to date again, 
but because I want to get you to a healthier place. But if I have a client who fears holding them back because they don't want to love somebody with all their heart and then lose them again, I still want to work with them on that thing, but they have to make the decision ultimately whether or not they're willing to open their heart and take that risk. Well said. And I'm always very candid with everything. And I've said to you before, I never want to date again. I'm Mm -hmm. one of those people. Having said that, my mind is open to the fact that as soon as I say that, I could meet somebody tomorrow and change my mind completely. I don't feel personally that I have any issues with my self-worth holding me back or anything like that. I don't think fear is holding me back, although I really, really don't ever want to have to go through that caregiver experience and then lose someone at the end of it. Mine was eight months' worth of caring for my husband who had a brain tumor. But sometimes in caregiving, there's a lot of ugliness along with the heartbreak that goes along. So I don't think it's fear that's holding me back. I just think my life has kind of evolved to the point where I'm happy now. So why complicate it? But it's one of those things that every so often I think, well, does that make me weird? Because I don't really feel I want another partner. So sometimes I I sometimes have doubt in that respect, in that respect only, I suppose. Yeah, I don't think it makes you weird at all. I really, really, really don't. I have a lot of friends and clients who are in that same space. It's not self-esteem or self-worth or guilt or even fear holding them back. It's that, you know, they're at a good place in life. And they just don't feel like they want to explore it. The only thing that I would say to someone in that type of situation is if you're open to it, be open to it. Like you said, like it's not you're not looking for it. But if it came out of nowhere and kind of like hit you upside the head, right, like you'd be open to it. And I think that that's a good thing as well. Yeah, you know, that's again, that's that's just me. Sometimes I think I'm a little weird, but I've chosen the word eclectic instead because that's a little classier sounding, (laughs) I think. You also kind of cover in your book a situation that I'm sure happens to a lot of people, and that's where the person that you come to love after you've lost someone happens to be a good friend of the person who was lost. How difficult is that to manage? What are some of the the pitfalls, if you could, that might happen? I'm going to answer that question in a little bit of a different way, if that's okay. Okay, sure. I think that, and I again, I may have talked about this in the last podcast, but it bears repeating, I think. So for nice guys, I think it can be a challenging for them to ask a widow out because they don't know, is, is, this, is this woman open to dating? Will it completely turn her off in every way and be the most off-putting thing in the world if I ask her out. You know, they have no idea. So I think that that's multiplied by about 50 billion if it's actually the friend of the deceased husband, right? Like if Joey's the deceased husband who passed away and Tom is his friend and Tom has always kind of like, you know, respected and thought a lot of the wife who's not a widow now a widow but eventually you know joey passes and now tom kind of maybe is starting to catch some feelings for the widow if he's a nice guy it's going to be very 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 hard for him to approach her in any way shape or form even the most respectful form right if if he doesn't know if she's ready to date and even if he does know that she's ready to date. It's still going to be very difficult for him because he was buddies with Joey. So for me, it's more about, it's so incredibly difficult to take that step. But I also have seen this in my coaching. Like it can be a really beautiful thing. It doesn't mean that just because he was friends with your deceased husband, that it's going to be a beautiful thing, right? That's the key part. It doesn't mean it's going to be beautiful. But it can be beautiful. So I think when we talk about like opening our mind to love again, one of the most important things I can say is keep an open mind. The stories I hear doing the amount of dating coaching I do, you never know where your next opportunity for great love can come. So you want to just really keep an open mind to what can come your way. 
that open mind is well it's important for all all facets of life really is to have that open mind don't don't close it you don't you'll never know what you're missing actually yeah i wondered that about that myself because often often after shortly after the funeral in fact it's not uncommon to start to be asked oh, let's meet for coffee let's do this or something and depending on where you are in your grief it can be very off putting mm-hmm. i remember many times thinking oh please just leave me alone if it was someone who and those were people who knew my husband certainly they weren't close friends but if it was a very very close friend like best friend or say even a sibling of the person you lost i can only imagine how difficult it must be so i will say to the widows out there that if for some reason you have interest to keep that open mind and if you see or think that a friend or sibling is interested in you maybe some hints might be appropriate do you have any example of those hints i know you gave a real good tip last podcast about a delivery person so. <laughs> yeah look i i this is something i teach all clients regardless of widowed or not widowed it's about opening the door right so again like i'm just going to be honest like a guy who's maybe not the type of man you want to end up in a relationship with, he might go up to 20 women a day and ask them out. He's not going to, he, he'll ask a widow out at the funeral. And, and I promise you that actually does happen. <laughs> like I've heard stories of that happen. But a quality guy is not going to necessarily know if you're ready to date, he might be hesitant. So it's about opening the door. You know, how do you do that? There are little ways that you can communicate to people, whether it's a one-on-one way, whether it's in a group, that you are open to dating again. The example I gave before, I won't give the whole thing again, but the example I gave before was, you know, I had a client who was somewhat interested in the delivery guy at her work. And he wouldn't ask her out. Well, I guess I am going to give the whole thing again. (laughs) That's okay. That's okay. He wouldn't ask her out, even though he was slightly flirting with her. And my client said, you know, I don't understand. Like, he seems like he's slightly flirting with me. And I said, does he know you're a widow? She goes, yeah. Good to see know that you're open to dating, that you're dating again. She goes, well, no. How would he know that? I said, well, you got to open the door for him, right? So I said, when he comes in on Monday, ask him what he did this weekend. He's going to tell you. If he knows how to have a conversation at all, he's going to say, what did you do? We're going to tell a little white lie, just a little white lie. We're going to say that you went on, you know, a date this weekend and it wasn't that good, right? You're going to do it with a little bit of a, like a little bit of a laugh, make it like a kind of a funny thing, right? What you did in that moment was you told him, yes, I am a widow, but not only am I open to dating, I'm actively dating, but I haven't met anybody yet. So you open the door wide open for this man to walk through it and to ask you out in a way where he knows he's not going to insult you. That's just one example I can give. I think that, again, whether widowed or not widowed, it is about opening the door for people to approach you, to ask you out. It makes dating so much easier because as men, believe me, we have our insecurities too, right? (laughs) If you can open the door for us and make it a little bit easier on us with a smile, with a glance, with an opening of some conversation, it just makes it that much easier for us to ask you out. Yeah, I just love that tip. In fact, every time now I engage with a delivery driver, I just kind of think of that example. And again, I think you should write another book with all of these tips for people that want to date on opening the door and, and maybe the open mind part or something like that. I think it would be very helpful. There was another piece in here that just I thought was very appropriate. Oh, it was the part of how widows or anyone who's grieving actually, not only do you miss the person and and all the memories you have, you think of those all the time, but you miss the future. The future that you are not having and the future that your lost person is also not having. So how does that complicate the dating process? Yeah, there's a meme I wrote about this a while ago. I think I put it in the book. And it says, we don't just miss the past and the present. We miss the future. We miss the future that we missed. I'll give you a real life example. Michelle and I were legally married, but we got married at the courthouse right after she got sick. She was throwing up. She was in 
incredible pain the whole time we were there after you know we did uh, the vows i took her to the emergency room where we stayed for five days until her surgery the cancer came back eventually we decided to plan a real wedding she died two weeks before that real wedding so if i get married one day like at an actual wedding ceremony where i have a bride walking down the aisle that's going to be a very happy day for me it's also going to be a sad day right because even though i will have be in love again at that point and i will be happy i didn't get that with michelle this is one of the million reasons why after a profound loss grief never fully ends if you have kids when the kid starts driving when the kid graduates when the kid has a kid you're going to miss your person you're not just missing them in the past you're also missing them in the present. You miss the future that you missed with them. You miss the thought of growing old with them, of retiring with them. We miss them in every new experience that we have, which is one of the reasons why even if you fall in love again, madly in love again, and you're profoundly happy with your romantic life again, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean you're just good to go. Society thinks that if you find love again, you're good to go. The pain of losing your still person, your person is still going to walk with you in some form. Okay. And that leads me right into the next question I have is we're used to saying, are you happy or are you sad? But you maintain we can be both at the same time. How? That example I gave is one that, that that's to, that's to me is the perfect example, right? I will be happy on that wedding day. And I will be sad because Michelle, the woman that I loved from the age of 17, I never got to see her walk down the aisle, right? I mean, if my stepdaughter has a kid one day and they come to the waiting room and say, your grandson is born, we will both be happy and we will feel sadness because Michelle is not there to enjoy it with us. It's just like the, the feelings of gratitude and being cheated. I have so much gratitude for the fact that Michelle and I got the last five years of her life together. So much gratitude. I could talk about that for hours on itself. But I was also cheated and so was she. Both of those things are true at the exact same time. Yeah, that, that makes sense when you do it. But we're not used to thinking of two opposing emotions occupying our brains at the same time. But it does make a lot of sense. Thank you. Guess what time it is, John? We're running out of time again. So again, I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Let our listeners know what you've been up to, what might be in the works, and anything else you'd like to share with them. Well, thank you again for having me back. I really appreciate it. Uh, I love coming on and doing the podcast with you. So my website is johnpolocoaching.com. I have three books out. They are the most easy to read, unique grief books you will ever read. I created them for people with ADD or ADHD and grief brain because I couldn't read after I lost my wife and I wanted to create books for other people who were struggling to read. They're very unique in the sense of I'm, a, I'm unique the way I write, but also that you will cry on one page and laugh on the next. The third book, which we've been talking about today, is the dating book. Again, I urge the widowed person to read it first, and then if they like it, to hand to a love interest. I offer all types of coaching, so grief coaching, dating coaching, purpose, motivation, self-esteem, self-worth, and I'm a full-time speaker if anybody needs one. John's contact information, website, email will be on our website and also on the podcast episodes. He's right. He's a unique writer. Because his books, uh, it's like sitting down at the bar, having a beer, and having somebody kind of tell you where it's at. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't um, sugarcoat things. He's very honest, very to the point. And as I said before, sometimes comes across as snarky, but I love that because sometimes that's exactly what I need to hear. You can read this book a page at a time. Some pages have only a few phrases on them. Others, there might be something that will run for a couple pages. It is easy to read. It does not have to be read start to end. You can open it in the middle, and whatever you read on that page will still make perfect sense to you. I strongly encourage anyone who is ready to date 
who has lost a partner, and this goes through male or female, whether you've lost a partner or a spouse, whatever it was, that little piece of paper doesn't really mean anything in the area of grief. If you lose someone you love, it hurts. It's overwhelming. And to me, grief never ends. It changes, yes, but it never really ends. So go buy this book if you're open to dating. Read it, as John suggests. Have it handy to let someone borrow or even to gift it to them. I think your relationship will be richer for it. So until next week, let me say farewell, a reminder to self-care. I'm going to plug the book again. It's How to Date a Widow 101 by John Polo. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.